Imagine entering a sacred space, seeing friends, family, and neighbors, and lifting your voice together in prayer and song. Imagine joining together to celebrate holidays, grieve loss, and serve your community. When in-person worship in New Mexico and nationwide was reduced or ended with the outbreak of the pandemic, many religious communities have brought their observances online, including services, holiday celebrations, life events, and charitable work. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by Rabbi Harry Rosenfeld, the rabbi at Congregation Albert in Albuquerque, and the Reverend Bob Lavallee, a minister at the First Unitarian Church of Albuquerque, two religious communities that have moved completely online during the pandemic. Thank you both so much for joining us today. This is a really exciting new kind of conversation. I don't think we could have had it a year ago. To what extent did you have an online presence before all this happened? At First Unitarian, we made some investments for us to be able to record the video of our services and then post them on YouTube. Frankly, we did not invest a lot of focus in creating a great online experience for folks. I remember we kind of just let the folks in the back running the cameras do what they want. I remember one time going back to watch one of my sermons line and right when I was in the final couple of paragraphs, when I was really going to bring it on home, the camera person decided to do a soft fade over to a candle. So I'm like declaiming and meanwhile he's doing a slow close up of a candle. So we were not thinking about it a lot. We were just really focused on the live experience. I've been talking about it since I got here, but the investment, the amount that it would cost to bring it in was prohibitive all these years. And then about three years ago, I think, I started bringing my iPhone up onto the Bema, which is what we call the pulpit. And I spent 10 bucks to buy a tripod and I recorded our high holiday services. Actually, we streamed them to Facebook and Facebook keeps them as a permanent record. This has changed everything. And we've switched to Zoom while simultaneously streaming to Facebook also. What was the impetus, though, for putting that online? Was that for people that couldn't attend in person or to have the record or a little bit of both? I wanted everything online because there are so many people locally who can't travel even within town to come to services. They're homebound or they're in care facilities or they're in hospitals or they're lazy. Let's be honest. So I wanted to do it all these years for them. Also, we're in New Mexico. And while the three largest cities have synagogues and weekly services, the vast majority of the state is not covered with religious worship. So I thought by putting these things online, people would have access to them. What it turned out to be, those early ones, was that my friends would show up, other people would tell their relatives that this was going to happen, and then people from out of town and multiple places within the state or around the country could celebrate the holidays with their families. For both of you, do you think it helped a little bit to be ahead of the game in that regard? For me, a congregation, Albert, not in the least. Um, <laughs> because what we were doing was so basic. I mean, it was literally put the phone up, plug an external battery in the phone, and you hit live stream. Whatever it showed, it showed. And that was purposeful because it was experiment. Well, you know, to become a Unitarian Universalist minister, you have to do a ministerial internship at a church. And I actually did mine at the UUA's online church, the Church of the Larger Fellowship. So I had two years of time doing this before we got there. And it's funny, I started in, in Albuquerque in August of 2019. And about four months into the job, I was like, wow, I would be so much better at my job if I had only done my internship at a bricks and mortar church. And then lo and behold, the walls <laughs> came down and I was like, I had a really strong sense of how to create powerful religious experiences online. So we made a pretty quick transition. It is interesting because when I was doing that, my internship at the Church of the Larger Fellowship, the gatekeepers at our denomination, I had to jump through hoops to get a waiver because they didn't think it was real church. And lo and behold, years later, that experience has been invaluable. I'm curious about what makes a real religious gathering when you can't be together in person. 
That is the nut of it right there. We've tried not to throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. We've tried to be conscious about it, and that doesn't mean everything has worked. So, for example, the service we had on January 8th after the January 6th insurrection, I felt it was important to not use slides so that everyone on Zoom at least had the potential of seeing other people. We've had to figure out how to digitally use mute and unmute for various parts of the service. Now we have shut down the chat during most of the service. We open it when we unmute, but people were finding it distracting because people were sending private messages to them and, and just the public messages. Not that anything was inappropriate. It was just distracting. It's funny because in some ways that's what might actually happen if you were there in person is, you know, the two moms behind you are just, (laughs) right? We have spent a lot of time thinking about the decision to mute and unmute live voices and also the chat. We do it over Zoom. We made an intentional decision to do Zoom meeting, not Zoom webinar, so people could see each other's faces. The act of seeing each other's faces is also a kind of prayer, right? We actually don't allow the congregants to unmute themselves at any point during the service. Mostly when it was happening, it was inadvertent and often embarrassing. And we shut down the chat too, but only during our meditation. We always have a two or three minute meditation and during the prayer. We're a church of 850 members. And so when we meet, it's large church service. And smaller churches will do a thing called joys and concerns, where they open up part of the service to the floor where people can bring up things they're celebrating and things that they're mourning. And it works in small churches more or less, but in a big church, it's just impossible and disruptive. So we had to get rid of that entirely. But online, we can do it because we open up the chat. You know, it's like a fire hose. People just putting in all these different things. And then I'm taking notes furiously and then point out different things and then say a blessing for all of it. So that's actually a a thing that online services gave us that we couldn't have done live. We do something similar. For example, we do a healing list that we read and then we open it up and we open the chat and we unmute and nobody's saying any names out loud. They are putting them in the chat. And then we do a section on blessings. When we were in person, sometimes it was like pulling teeth to get people to say something. Online, it is darn near impossible. And I get the same two or three people It morphs over time. So now there's one physician who every week says, thank you for the blessing of the vaccine, right? You know, we're not going to stop doing it, but it was much more lively when we were in person. I've found people are actually more vulnerable, more open online, and they'll share things about their mental health or financial situations. You know, being a religious leader is very difficult work and it's emotionally draining on every level. And one of the things that feeds religious leaders, certainly for me, is the face-to-face connection with the people we serve. And that part was a really huge loss. How's it been for you, Rabbi Harry? Well, what I did find is that my sermons are worse, and it took me a while to figure out why. You know, it's not like I wasn't saying the same kinds of things and putting the same prep in and everything. I realized, and it took a while, that even though I see people's faces on Zoom, I'm not getting the feedback. The other thing, and this goes outside of services, outside of worship and prayer, is the pastoral work. It's really hard. I mean, I always made phone calls. I always sent emails. It's really hard now because I haven't been to visit a care facility or a shut-in in just under a year. And they miss that and I miss that. And the only way I've been able to compensate for that, and it's not much of a compensation, is I'm writing handwritten notes with a real pen. I get much better feedback from that, even from younger people who generally only respond to text. The thing about preaching to a green dot on Zoom, it's a struggle. I really miss hearing people laugh at my jokes. <laughs> That's been a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Or groan. Let's not forget the groan part. Watching an idea land and watching it ripple through a big room, it is feeding. But you know, to your point, Rabbi, and I think this really speaks to online services, is one of the things that we have to do is create a sense of intimacy. So a handwritten note is a totally different level of intimacy from an email. One thing I kind of like about doing Zoom from our homes is that people are seeing the inside of my home. They're seeing my art. They're seeing my dog actually will climb on the couch behind me and sleep. And everyone knows about Gus. And Rabbi, I don't know if you're broadcasting from the temple, right? No. The only services we did from temple, from the building, were Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Everything else has been from home. And when we did that, the only people who were there were Cantor Finn, me, a technician, a custodian, 
and two ASL interpreters. So we've been home. My dog, Wyatt, is always by my side when we're doing services because he knows that at some point during the services, we're going to be doing the blessing over bread. And <laughs> Well trained. But yeah, I think it's very important. I'm always here in my study. Since the weather turned and it got dark in the evenings, I can't be outside for our morning service because of where the sun is and that kind of thing. But I miss going back outside and doing it on my back porch. Even when it first started getting dark and it was warm, I would turn our fire pit on. I love doing services outside normally. You know, when you look out the windows when we're in the building, you're seeing a couple of trees and whatever. I get much more inspired here because I see a lot of trees and I see the sandias or the stars or the blue sky or even the gray sky sometimes. And I miss that. I didn't realize how much that kept me in a spiritual place while doing services online until I had to move inside full time. I love when the weather was nicer and we would do services and I'd see people logging in from their porches or their picnic tables. That was really beautiful. Although I have a colleague, another UU minister, who's had to figure out what to do about a congregant who insists on logging in from his hot tub. Ah. <laughs> that is his sacred space, apparently. I will say that the advantage to mute and shut off video that the host has, I will say that there have been times I have taken pleasure in muting somebody. I have not had to turn off somebody's video, thank God. Although we do have a problem when it comes to video is there are times in the service where people stand. Now we tell them they can rise physically or spiritually, right? And I stay seated and I just try to, you know, sit taller, but there are people who stand and you're seeing the wrong things and it's just not good. And there are things about this experience which do bring a smile because the absurdity of it. During High Holy Days, especially, but pretty much every Shabbat, every Sabbath service we do, there's somebody's family member online. That just couldn't happen before. And kids who live in other places, or parents who live in other places, it's always fun when Cantor Finn's mother logs on. We always say hi. and She'll be watching the Facebook feed, but we always make sure we say hi. Look, Mom, we're on the internet. <laughs> That's right. Because I think it brings that intimacy, that feeling of connection, which is so, so hard in this virtual world of ours. I don't know if you lead services from the spot you're in, but like looking past you into your background, like I feel like I know you better. I see that old photo of your wedding day looks like and your art. Oh, thanks for the old comment. <laughs> <laughs> it's only been 33 years. Mean, I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. But it's black and white and charming. And I think that's good. But I actually attended part of your high holiday service and stood up when you told people to stand up and the camera was not aimed at my midsection, but there was something about that embodied moment where I knew that there was a congregation scattered all over New Mexico that was standing up with me. When the pandemic began, we were really worried about disconnection, about people drifting off. So we added a second service during the middle of the week, a Wednesday night Vespers. It's short, there's no homily, it's more contemplative. We always end with, we call it the Pacham greeting. We have everyone put one hand over their heart and another hand reach towards the camera. And then we say, reach out to your community. These are the people who are here with you. Look at each other with gratitude. And we'd ask people to put the Zoom in gallery view so they could see each other's faces. And I'm trying to find all those little things. Like we always light a chalice at the beginning of every service. And we invite people to light chalices at home or candles or just do something that's real and physical and embodied to bring it into their households. You tried any of that? Here and there. I mean, we light candles every Friday and we say blessings over wine and bread every Friday and Saturday. And people do it. We see people holding up their cups. You're right. It adds something. We encourage people to turn on their cameras, those that have them. And we've given cameras to a few people who didn't have cameras. We've given some of our older members some iPads and other tablets so that they can participate in Zoom. But talking about standing up, one of the things that I miss that I tried early on and it worked, but you can't host and do it, is I would set my camera up on a tripod outside on the porch and I would do the service standing up. But between being farther away from the camera and the limitations of the Zoom software on mobile devices, it's just too hard. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. I want to say thank you again so much for taking the time to have this conversation with us. I am thinking about things I have never thought about. And one of the things about religious communities is that it's not just the services, right? But there's a ton of other stuff from religious education to pastoral care to work within the community. So what is that looking like at this time? It was a painful decision to shut the campus down, but we decided that the only program that we would continue live on our campus was our food pantry, given the severity of the need. And so still once a week, we're handing out 100 bags of groceries and with a lot of precautions and reworking to make it safe. But beyond that, everything is online and some things have translated well and some things have not translated well. We have covenant groups that seem to be functioning pretty well. Those are small group spiritual direction kind of activities. It's been a real challenge for our children and youth religious education to make the transition, but our staff has done incredible work being creative. But, you know, the attention span is shorter. You know, when you're dealing with children, five, six, seven, eight years old, we're asking that a parent be in the room with the child. Unlike when we do live worship, you know, the parent drops the kid off, goes to worship. It's so much harder to keep a young child focused on Zoom compared to in person, and it's not embodied. So that's been a struggle. Can I ask, Reverend Bob, with the parents in the room, though, is there any silver lining there, like a little more involvement from the parents themselves or like a bonding? Making a sweeping generalization, our parents are exhausted right now, and online school is such a huge burden, and they really don't want to spend more time online, and it's a real struggle and doing like the behavior management kind of thing for yet another session. Yeah, I get that. Exactly. It's pretty joyless, yeah. Our kids' enrollment's at about 35, 40% of usual for online. And since it's Sunday morning and Wednesday evenings, a lot of parents told us they were not going to sign their kids up this year because the kids are doing it five days a week. And there was one parent, although others have mentioned it, but one parent said it so well. After years of trying to cut my child's screen time, I have totally lost the battle. And I'd never thought of that reality before. Our adult education program, though, has really been incredible this year. I'm part of a coaching group of rabbis. We meet once a year, but we're all very close and have become close over the past 15 years or so. And one of the guys, unfortunately not me, because I would have loved to have been this brilliant to have come up with this idea, suggested that we do a program that we call Scholars in Their Residence. And he coordinated the first six, which were over the summer. And I've sort of taken over the coordinating of the subsequent pieces of the series. And we've been able to pool our resources and be able to afford speakers that we could never afford on our own. And it's just been this incredible thing. And We have 12 congregations and we get 150 to 200, although the one that was the same time as the Super Bowl was way less, Uh, (laughs) but it's recorded and online so people can come back to it. But, you know, we get close to 200 people for these things that if any of us did it on our own, we'd get 12 to 50 people. So here we do not mute people when they come in. And we keep the chat open because we ask people to post questions in the chat and then one of us asks the questions. But these people, they start going, yeah, I'm in Miami, I'm in LA, I'm in Albuquerque, I'm in El Paso, I'm in New Jersey, you know. As good as the speakers have been, that has just been so amazing to have these people from literally the span of the country, all of a sudden feeling connected to congregations, communities, and individuals that they never would have ever thought of. It's been a real blessing to have this and to be able to really bring in speakers that we could not afford. We can afford them as a group because one, they're online and we're not paying for travel and expenses. Two, we're not asking people to speak here for an hour or two. We usually go about an hour, hour and a quarter when we're online. But if we bring someone in to speak here for an hour, they want a larger fee because they had to travel. So people have been very willing to cut their fees down to the bare minimum. And what they've told us is that they're enjoying it a lot And they're hoping that when people can be in person and whatnot, that congregations will invite them in and they could do things in person. So that's been a real boon to all of our communities. Have you found that within your congregation with this ability to reach out, because travel doesn't matter anymore, that there's a deeper sense of your faith being part of a bigger collective faith? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
maybe not if we were in New York or LA or Miami or you know some of those places because there's so many congregations and it's easy to collaborate and cooperate. We don't have that opportunity here. And as much as we may talk about being part of a larger Reformed Jewish movement, right, it's droning after a while, whereas this makes it real. Especially the series over the summer, we started purposely with a series about Reformed Judaism, and we had six speakers who were really great. Yeah, I think Unitarian Universalism is a weird little denomination that people often struggle to wrap their head around because it's, it's kind of unconventional. But there's a tendency, I think, in UU congregations to be inward focused and not have a sense that we're part of a larger movement. The senior minister, Reverend Angela, is on sabbatical for four months. I've had the great pleasure to line up the pulpit supply for those weekends where I'm not going to be preaching. Because it's a pandemic, I'm able to get all my favorite preachers. You know, yesterday we had a great minister from San Diego come in and, you know, really prominent UU ministers, which is a kind of an oxymoron, like famous UU ministers. But um, so it creates these opportunities because there's a porousness, right? That we're not separated by a plane anymore. I kind of want to ask both of you, what about the other aspects that I think are so important in religious life, weddings, funerals, bar and bat mitzvahs. And Reverend Bob, you'll have to forgive me. I don't know if there are coming of age rituals. That's what we call it, coming of age, yeah. So are you doing those? And if you are, how are you doing those? So what is that looking like for both of you? I mean, are people putting off weddings? They can't put off funerals and you come of age when you come of age. So what do you do? It's fascinating to me both the opportunities it's providing and the limitations that are required. So I'm just going to go age. So for naming ceremonies, those are all virtual. There's no way around that. You know, I could have three N95 masks on and I don't want to be anywhere near a vulnerable child. Are Moyles doing brisses? Yes. I have noticed, however, that the circumcision is happening not on the eighth day, but in the hospital before the child's released to go home. With bar and bat mitzvah, we've been doing all of ours virtually, and we don't restrict who someone has in their yard, right? We may think they're crazy for having that many people, and they may not be wearing masks, but that's their personal property, and we're not there. So Cantor Finn and I are online, they're online. I have them come to the synagogue and pick up a Torah scroll so that they have it at the house, although they're not reading from it. We actually have one family coming up who has a connection with an historic synagogue that does not have a congregation really anymore, but has been preserved and is maintained by surrounding communities that do have one. And he has a family connection to that. And so they're making arrangements where they'll be in that synagogue and Cantor, Finn and I will be online. Weddings. We have so far done all of our weddings in person beyond socially distanced. None of this six foot stuff, you know, 12, 15 feet. And the only people who are ever unmasked are the bride and groom or the groom and groom or the bride and bride, because at some point they have to kiss. And you gotta figure if they're getting married, they're part of their own little pod. Confirmation, which is our 16 year old 10th grade ceremony, we still haven't done the service for the 2020 class because they wanna to be together physically. So they requested a postponement. This year's class of 21, I'm sure it will be virtual or they may postpone. That's their choice. Funerals, however, it's interesting you say they can't be postponed. We do as many as possible virtually. Funerals are not covered by the 25% rule that worship services are. They're considered gatherings in New Mexico. They can only have five people right now because we're still a red county in the state system. They can only have five people plus the clergy, plus the cemetery worker or funeral home worker. So what we've done with that is only one of us, either Cantor Finn or I, go to the cemetery. And the other one is running the Zoom from their house and also participating from their home. And we bring an iPhone or an iPad and we Zoom it from there. And then the Shiva services or the Shiva gatherings, the memorial parts that people do at home afterwards, that's all virtual. But the reason it's interesting you say they can't postpone because I have not done a single memorial service, burial or funeral service where it hasn't listed in the obituary. And there will be something when we can all get back together. They may call it a memorial service, a celebration of life or whatever. That could be a year and a half, two years later. I'm going to be fascinated to see how many of these actually happen. But everybody's planning that. 
for the family to get together in a larger context. Right. You know, and not just for the dedication of the memorial stone. I wonder if when the pandemic ends, there'll be this period of huge amount of mourning services for specific people that might also act as a period of mourning for us as a culture about what we lost in the year and a half or two years that this has gone down. That would be interesting. It could be cathartic. You know, it could be powerful. So I have agreed to do one more wedding in person, and that's for my adopted family, the family that kind of took me in when my mother died and it was just my dad and me. Their granddaughter is getting married. And I said, look, you know, it's in September. I said, if I'm fully vaccinated by then, I'll travel. If I'm not, I'm not coming. And we'll do it virtually. I'll be there. You can get whatever size screen you would like. And they just had another family wedding the other day. And the great uncle, who's also a rabbi, did part of the ceremony zooming in from Israel. So it's something that they're partially used to, at least. But yeah, since I'm expecting to be vaccinated by 2029, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it by September, but I'd really like to be there. This is close family. When my father-in-law died back in April, Michelle and I went back for the burial and then to clean out the house. But that was April. And the largest number of people we had on an airplane at that point was eight, including the crew. And there was nobody in the airport. I mean, not workers, not anybody. So now it's very different where everything's crowded again. And I know I'm not flying unless it's an emergency and until I'm fully vaccinated. And Reverend Bob, what about at the Unitarian Church? What are your life cycle events looking like? Pretty much the same. We won't do anything inside. And if pressed, we'll do things outside with a lot of precautions. So I've done graveside committals, but with a lot of distancing and short and sweet and out of there. Well, maybe not sweet, but yeah, we take it seriously. And I think we can accomplish a lot over Zoom. So it's worked pretty well. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. We've been talking a little bit about regular worship and life cycle events, but a lot of people only set foot in a house of worship on holidays. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm surprised. Imagine. <laughs> Some big holidays have passed in the pandemic, and there's big ones coming up. How does that look when you do either your congregational celebrations, minor holidays? How have you adjusted that? Well, First Unitarian, a worship service is a worship service. Our big holidays in the liturgical calendar and, you know, some are just another Sunday. So we haven't had to adjust a lot because we have our online services down well. But there are certain things that were important in the life of the church that we've tried to figure out more creative ways. Like the blessing of the backpacks was a ritual that we used to really enjoy. And so we actually did it as a drive through What is the blessing of the backpacks? What is the significance there? Children bring their backpacks and also adults, and they receive a blessing for their work and their learning. It's very touching. We set up a drive through with different stations, and Reverend Angela and I were out there in our stoles, in our robes with masks on, six feet apart, and people would drive up in their cars and roll down their windows, and we'd stand by the window and give our blessings, and we had squirt guns, <laughs> and we would squirt gun into the car, and then run around the car and squirt on the car, and it was pretty goofy. We had a big balloon arch, and pretty joyous. And the next station would be our director of religious education and her staff and would safely pass on a tray a little token related to the church and then send folks along. And we actually had another station where there was like a speaker with danceable music playing and we'd invite people to stop the car, get out of the car and dance and then get back into the car and leave. 
When our beloved ministerial intern, Jane Davis, left after two great years, we couldn't have the party that we would have had. So we arranged a drive-by of her house. And people made signs and plastered them on their cars. And we probably had 60 cars going by the house. And not the same, but it is something. For us at Congregation Albert, it has been a fascinating journey. Because the first holiday that came along was Passover. And I had this brilliant idea. I still think it's brilliant, even though pretty much everyone hated it. We always have a Seder, a Passover meal at the synagogue on the second night. And instead of doing that this year, I thought it would be a great idea if we sent out links to Seders across the world and people could experience a Seder in Israel or Morocco, Costa Rica, Australia. Most of them were recorded and available someplace. And I just thought that was a brilliant idea. And it's the only thing that we have done or not done, as the case may be, that people really, really disliked. So now we're trying to figure out what to do for this year, because it's not going to be that. For Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, as I said earlier, we were in the synagogue. We thought it was important. Cantor Finn and I were inside on the bima, on the pulpit, and we were each 20 feet apart. We each had cameras focused on us. And on the side of the chuppah that was between us, we asked the staff to put up a uh, visqueen, clear plastic. And the first thing they did was hang drop cloths. And we were like, no, it has to be clear so we can see each other, because that's very important. We got actually a good amount of feedback that it was nice to see the sanctuary. For Sukkot, we did do a drive through Sukkot's the holiday of booths. And so we had the custodians build a booth that spanned the driveway. I mean, it was huge. And I did the evening and Cantor Finn did the morning. And we stood there with the ritual objects, the lulav and the etrog, and we shook them like you're supposed to. And people drove through. And we were obviously masked and we were more than six feet away from the car. It was interesting to see people had masks on and other people didn't. I was really surprised. But even the people who had masks, it was so gratifying to at least see half their face in person. I mean, really. And then we had the whole rest of our staff there and we had prepared gift bags for everybody. You know, a piece of fruit, some liturgy and some learning and whatever. And so those got handed out and people loved that. We have since planned two others. One was for Thanksgiving and the governor shut everything down and we decided, even though technically we could have done it, that it wouldn't have been right to do that. And then the second one was supposed to be for Tubishvat, which is an outdoor holiday, planting of trees. And normally we take people and we all go down to the Bosque and plant trees. But this year, obviously, we couldn't. And so we planned a drive through and unfortunately, one of our staff members tested positive for COVID. And so we had to cancel that one also. So those drive throughs are just not working for us. <laughs> the interesting one will be, I retire this year. I retire technically June 30th. And so the first full weekend in May is my goodbye weekend. And it's going to be entirely virtual. And for me, that's great. Perfectly happy with that. <laughs> the introvert me is so happy about that. <laughs> And my colleague who I had asked to come in to speak, will do it virtually. Everything will be virtual. The Saturday night party will be virtual. I don't know what they have planned yet, but I'm just glad it's not in person. But unfortunately, they are also planning a drive through So I would expect a serious surge of COVID right before then, and the governor's going to have to shut down the state again. Because that's been the track record. That's our track record. The huge price that we've paid in the pandemic is the loss of singing together. And we quickly realized that you can't sing together on Zoom. It's horrible. And our poor music director, Susan Peck, who fundamentally sees her work as facilitating the act of people making music together. And she's a genius at her job. And she has done an absolutely amazing job from this place where she just had the rug pulled out from under her to really embracing the technology. And she wasn't necessarily that techie. And all these technologies, these applications are coming out that allow people to record tracks separately and then she can mix them. With the video, we actually get to see people's faces while they're singing together and harmonizing. And that's amazing. And it's a ton of work for her. But it's not the same as let's rise together and lift our voices, which, of course, is exactly the wrong behavior for COVID. It's exactly how you have a super spreader event. We did some of that for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur with our choir. A lot of synagogues across the country for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur pre-recorded everything and just broadcast it. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted the spontaneity and all that kind of stuff. I'm always going to make a mistake. And I think it humanizes the experience for everybody. But we did have recordings, recordings of the choir, recordings of people doing blessings. 
And then because we did some and it was all music, we felt okay to add a couple of, with licensing, performances by famous musicians who had appropriate songs. And that was nice. Isn't it amazing the tangible difference between a live and recorded performance? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. For the recordings we showed, we used live performances that we could find online and license. During our last coming of age, normally the youth do little mini homilies, little three minute homilies. So we had to do them on video. And one of them submitted a video of him playing his drums with a voiceover. We would never have been able to do that in the sanctuary. And it was really cool, really effective. If you're at your house, you know, in a Zoom meeting, you're looking at the regular Zoom gallery view or whatever it may be on your computer. When you're at the synagogue, Rabbi, do you have like a projection screen? No. That's part of what I've been fighting for for 10 years to get. We have put up screens in the past for high holidays and sometimes for just regular Shabbat Sabbath services, but it blocks so much of the pulpit area that I don't think it's really worth it to do it until we can actually get real technology in there. When you were doing the high holy day services, you weren't seeing who was participating. Did you have cardboard cutouts of nobody <laughs> that pays their we dues? We thought about it. Um, <laughs> You know, we have a number of stuffed toys from when we were kids, and my wife brought one, put it in the seat next to her, because the other people who were there with us were both of our spouses. And, you know, the way we had it set up was our tech people behind the cameras, where we could still see it, was a screen that was showing what was being broadcast. And the problem with that is you can't do gallery view. That's only speaker view. So I had my cell phone and or my iPad up there on my lectern, and I was using that in gallery view on Zoom so I could see people. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to see anybody. And as unsatisfying, as I said, as it is to only have people's faces online, it would have been so much worse without even that. Yeah, otherwise it's like you're just talking to an empty room and trying to muster that energy. Not like trying to talk to an empty room. It was talking to an empty room. I'm curious, you know, with all the choreography and figuring out music and figuring out what you can do over Zoom and what matters, how have you all adjusted your services? Bob, a little earlier you were talking about opening up more for people to share their blessings and their concerns. So that was an adjustment of the service. But were there things that you've had to give up because it's too impractical to try and create it as a virtual experience or to do it from home? A lot of it goes back to first principles, like what is the purpose of a religious community and what is the purpose of the worship service? You know, for us, it's a place for consolation, for community place to receive guidance and a place to be inspired to live into that guidance, you know? And then when the pandemic began, Angela and I very specifically said, our work during this time is three things, connection, engagement, and resilience. So everything we were doing had to feed that and give us direction. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a lot of freedom with our liturgy. So we could tinker with things. It's still important for us to think about the arc of the service and how the different parts connect and carry through. Thinking back to the pre-pandemic live services, I'm having a hard time remembering them in some ways. Like It just feels like I've been doing this forever now. How's it been for you, Rabbi? I don't know. It's strange. The whole, the whole thing is just strange. It really is strange. One of the things, we consciously made an effort to shorten the service, which, you know, if we ever do go back to in-person services, I think people are going to expect, and I don't know if they'll be disappointed. There are certain parts of the service that we did change significantly, like the reading from the Torah scroll. I share a screen of the text online over Zoom, and I read it that way. I did bring a Torah scroll home a few times, but my space isn't really conducive to putting in another table. I did it for a few weeks and just wasn't working for me or others. Other changes we made are really kind of painful, like the not singing together. I have, on a couple of occasions, unmuted everybody so that we could hear that cacophony, but it was in an appropriate moment to do that. We've even done that for some of the readings, like Mourner's Kaddish. So we've done that a few times to create that sense of community. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That's all fine. I, however, am convinced there's no going back from this. This was coming anyhow, and the pandemic just sped it up. We're absolutely committed to continuing an online live presence. We've actually had more than 30 folks join 
First Unitarian since we went online. And they're from all over the place, and we're not going to leave those folks behind. And so going hybrid, that's going to be a thing. So I don't like the word hybrid. I mean, I don't understand it in this context. I read just yesterday a blog post by Cantor Rosalie Will about going hybrid. And she asked some really important questions in her blog about it. Are you just going to broadcast your service, right? You're going to be up in your worship space and just have cameras on everybody. Or are you going to create separate worship experiences? One for those who are in person and one for those who are online. And it's easier to design. What does that do to the sense of community? Now, there are lots of synagogues, lots of churches, lots of other religious organizations that have multiple services during the course of a day, right? Oftentimes that's for space use, but you know, in front of churches, traditional service at nine o'clock, modern service at 11. So there are some different styles of services that people do at different times. I just don't know what would be best. And someone asked me why I'm retired and not joking about it. I know it's time to retire because I see what I'm pretty sure the future will be and what's needed in the coming decades. I don't know how to get there. And I've been doing this for 40 years, and it's not like I don't have the experience and I don't have the skill sets. You know, like Bob, you did that internship for two years online. Yeah, but we actually tried during my internship, I'm going to use the word hybrid, no offense, Rabbi Harry, to simultaneously do online live worship with in-person worship at our sibling church in Portland. And it was really, really, really hard. So do we want it to be like a Saturday Night Live kind of situation where there is a studio audience in the room that's providing the laugh track, but the real audience is the ones watching on TV. And I think the studio audience has a less of an experience. I mean, we're committed to it, but we got a lot of questions. I think it's going to be very volunteer and gear intensive to do both well. Yeah. Yes. I never want to lose the accessibility that we have now. Not only just folks who have different kinds of financial situations that doesn't allow them to come to church or a disability, but one thing I'm seeing, folks with marginalized identities traditionally are more comfortable coming to an online service. They feel safer coming to an online service. We're a multicultural congregation, but we are predominantly white and middle class, upper middle class. And just walking into that room and seeing the overwhelming culture of it, it makes it hard for people to access the spiritual place. But if someone is trans or a person of color, and when they come into church live, they're bracing for the microaggression. Well, they can go to live church, but they're protected from that. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Rabbi Rosenfeld, Reverend Bob, thanks so much for being with us today. I'm curious about some of the other aspects of religious life. For me, and I'm sure for many of our listeners, a good chunk of religious life is the parts of gatherings that take place before and after services and um, before and after the bar mitzvah when people are eating and talking and drinking and eating and talking and drinking. And I'm curious what that is looking like during the pandemic, or if there's similar opportunities for people to sort of gather in these informal social ways, given that it hasn't always been available to them physically. 
we do breakout rooms after the end of the service, sort of like our equivalent of coffee hour. People can go into small groups and we want explicitly for biopoc folks. And that's a thing we can't do live. I guess we could, but it would be weirder. One of the things we lose by all this virtual stuff is the lobby. When we redesigned our building in Buffalo when I was there, everybody wanted to do this to the sanctuary or that to the chapel or whatever it was. And I pushed to create lobby spaces that people could just gather and sit together and have those informal conversations. For example, we took out the wall at the library, which was in the middle of the hall, and we put in a glass wall with sliding doors so people could walk in, people could see who was there. And it changed the whole dynamic of people who came, whether it was for a service or a life cycle event or for a social event or whatever. And so synagogue and church architecture is so important. And that was really driven home to me, right? Because one of the things I do do is either before or after our service, I look at other people's services. And some people are actually doing it from their sanctuary spaces. And I look at the sanctuary space and I go, oh, that's just ugly, right? And there's something dispiriting about an empty sanctuary, like a camera and one person up front, like rattling around this giant space. It does not work. Well, that too. And I was invited to an online wedding this weekend, and it was in a synagogue that I grew up in, and I knew it was ugly when I was a kid. It's and, so and, and that was in the 60s, and it was designed in the 50s. And, you know, in the 2020s, 70 years later, it is ugly. And it really detracted from the feeling of the wedding. Beauty matters. Beauty matters. And Bob, you said earlier how seeing us in our home spaces lets people get to know us, right? I consciously choose to do this in my home study because it is that combination of the personal, but also Judaism and Jews are known as the people of the book. So I've got a small part of my library. I don't know what I would to put the rest of my library when I retire, but you know, it tells people a little bit about who I am, the wedding picture, the books, the dog coming, all that stuff. And we didn't talk about this yet. One of the things that's really hard for me because I work off of a laptop is I have to connect a second screen because I'm also the host and I have to see lots of different pieces. And so while I try and look at the laptop, there are times I turn my head and I'm sort of seeing people out of the corner of my eye, but they know I'm not looking at them. And that's something I don't like. I've tried putting the screen above, you know, stacking them and whatnot. They're those kinds of technical issues which are parallel for what I think is key for any religious worship institution is an incredibly welcoming lobby. We have those issues online just like we have them in person. Just like we have security guards sometimes at services, we've had to introduce Zoom protocols to prevent Zoom bombing. You know, and we try and keep ours to a minimum and we haven't had an incident, thank God, but other synagogues have, including here in Albuquerque. And we actually have dedicated volunteers, one of whom is constantly watching the chat to see if there's anything inappropriate in the chat and they'll automatically boot someone out. Hasn't happened yet. And then another person is scrolling up and down the video to see if anyone's doing anything inappropriate in their video and they'll automatically boot them out. But that's two volunteers every Sunday. So when you say a Zoom bomb, Rabbi, what does that mean for the listener that might not have any idea what you're talking about? If you don't have your Zoom security or any platform security settings set properly, it is not that difficult for someone to come in and take over your screen. As the dominant speaker screen. Exactly. And so we have made sure, and we double check every couple of weeks to make sure that they haven't changed because Zoom keeps putting out updates and sometimes things inadvertently change to make sure that our settings are all correct. Because the ultimate security is you don't let people in who don't pre-register and you don't let people pre-register who you don't know. We don't want to do that because it's so off-putting. Yeah. And it's against the open service ethos to begin with in the physical world. Exactly. Exactly. Finding the balance of all these things is exactly hard. Yeah. That's right. So we ask people to put their first and last names up. Now, there's no guarantee they're going to tell the truth. I mean, seriously, if somebody wants to do damage or be malicious, they're going to find a way. But it's at least something. And we have, both during worship and during some of the adult ed things, we've removed people who have refused to change their names. 
we always say, if you don't know how to do this, let us know and who you are and we'll do it for you. But Bob's iPhone tells me nothing, right? George's or Sally's or Carol's iPad is meaningless when it comes to security. And so we rename people when they let us, we ask them to rename themselves. But after three or four times of asking, we have removed people and we have our settings so that if we remove somebody, not if somebody logs off and comes back on, but if we remove them, they can't come back on, which became a problem the other day when I removed one of the speakers because they wouldn't change their name. I couldn't tell who it was. It was a family member in the funeral. In fact, someone who was gonna give a eulogy and she didn't change her name and I had no idea who it was and she wouldn't change her name, so I removed her. And then she sent me an email saying I got kicked out and I can't get back in and I figured out who it was. And fortunately, this was before the funeral started. You know, it was just that sort of pre-gathering time because we try and log on 15 minutes early before everything. And I said, okay, I'm gonna log off and log back on and that will solve the problem. <laughs> and it did. But I'd rather make the mistake that way than allow an anti-Semite or just a kid who likes to pull pranks. We had a lot of anxiety about that early on where one congregant saying, hey, my son's kindergarten class got Zoom bombed and the Zoom bomber shared pornography and we're all kind of horrified right now. And we're actually afraid to come to church. And so I laid out, like, we have extensive protocols and we're pretty comfortable that it'd be tough to do anything for any amount of time, but it's real. So I just have a question with all this. I mean, this is figuring out internet, videography, protocol, security. That's not really what you went to seminary or rabbi school for. Well, Bob evidently did in his internship. And when I went to seminary, none of this existed. Right, right. But I mean, what kind of teams are you working with? Who's behind the scenes with the cameras and the tech and the know-how? Or are you in Cantor or Googling late at night? The Cantor and I do most everything. When we need it, our administrator will come on. High holidays, of course, were different. We hired a professional and all that. We can't afford that. I have yet to find a volunteer over the age of 11 who has the technical skills that we might need. I'm also in a unique place because I am retiring and there's only so many changes or new structures I'm willing to put into place before the new rabbi comes because they're the one who's going to be here longer term. Whether that's five years or 20 years, I don't know. That kind of decision, Ellen, needs to be made by the next person. You know, we're doing what we need to do. And it's not like we're sitting still, but I'm trying to be very judicious about changes and structures that I'm putting into place this year. Well, you know, I'm actually a little surprised you're still playing the host in your services, Rabbi. It's because I have no control issues whatsoever. (laughs) I know, I like to tell people I'm a laid back, mellow control freak. Uh, And I actually do see that show up a little bit around online worship where I have such strong opinions and I bristle sometimes at some of the suggestions I hear. But I was our host initially just to get us going because we had about five days notice to the first online service and did it for a couple months, but really focused on training a team to take that over. And I never host anymore. I'm free to focus on the text and focus on the words. And that makes a huge difference. We've trained up a team of hosts and we call them DJs. We've trained up ushers who are our our bouncers. And like you were saying, Rabbi, like how you provided iPads and so on. And we've been trying to find folks in our congregation who are not coming to service because they don't have internet access to say, hey, we'll work something out with you. You know, we'll cover you for internet access for a while and get you a device and get you on so you've connected. But one of the things we specifically do is we have a dedicated tech service person on every service and we put their phone number in the chat. And like, if you're having a problem, call so-and-so at this number. We try to be even more proactive. If we see someone who's typing into the chat, I have no sound, or if we see them over and over trying to get into the meeting and falling out, we'll look up their number in the directory and that tech person will call them and say, hey, I see you're struggling to get into the service. When we're doing that, we're practicing really good church to bring everyone along. I love those ideas. And I'm not willing to put together a team like that because of the transition that the synagogue is about to go through. But I like a lot of those ideas. And I think those are some really, really, really good solutions. 
four or five months in, we finally just realized we needed more help. And so we hired a halftime tech arts director who was a professional videographer in his other life. So he's now working like four jobs. And so he's doing all the editing for us, but he's also managing the volunteers and doing the training. And he's often the host. And that was a gift. Before we finish our program for today, I have one question. Neither of you might have an answer, but in hearing some of the technical challenges, say, of managing streaming to Facebook or streaming to YouTube or managing a bunch of people in a Zoom meeting, are there any platforms that have been discussed or are being developed that are specifically geared towards online worship? I'm thinking the security aspects, the virtual lobby aspects, the technical support aspects, being able to put up liturgical information in a coherent way. Have you heard anything like in the rumor mill of anyone that's actually developing a platform that would be perfect? My first reaction is the thought of having to teach our congregation a new platform just makes me want to pull my non-existent hair out, you know? So some of it is, even if there were something, there's something to be said for not changing horses once people are adapting. Right. We started out purely on Facebook, and then we added in Zoom and live stream. A lot of people are using Zoom, but they're using another technology with Zoom to make the Zoom experience better. You know, a lot of my colleagues are using those kinds of things. If that kind of software was to be created, it would have to come out of the Christian world because the Christian world is the only world that is large enough to make it economically viable. Even if the Christian world were to develop this, and I'm sure maybe in the mega churches, it's way farther along than it is for any of the rest of us, there still may not be a large enough market to make it viable. Actually, you know, I want to say one thing real fast. I was looking at some stuff from our church archives the other day, and uh, I saw where back in 1950, when First Jew was just forming, they were meeting at Temple Albert when it was still on gold. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Well, this has just been a wonderful discussion. The time really flew, at least for me anyway. Reverend Bob, Rabbi Rosenfeld, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure. Oh, you're so welcome. And if you would like more information, you can visit Congregation Albert at congregationalbert.org and the First Unitarian Church of Albuquerque at uuabq.com. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council, produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Club.